I'm so glad that you are here in the beginning of a brand new series called Battles and Breakthrough. And it's not just a sermon series, as Pastor Brandon was just mentioning. We are doing a 30 Days of Freedom journey. We're going to be having nights of worship, uh, joining you live in the morning for devotions, and going on a journey where we're believing that God is going to not only bring freedom, but break some strongholds in your life. In this series, what we're going to do is bring to you every week a battle that is real, that you you're up against and show you how to get breakthrough battles and breakthrough. And I don't know about you, as you look out on the world today, whether it's in news or politics or education or wherever, and you just kind of get a sense, something's wrong. You know, whenever like, do you sense like and see and interpret some of the signs and go, this ain't right. You watch the Olympics and go, something's off. What is going on here? Am I alone? Are you guys with me here? Like, cause if you don't get this, like it, it's gonna be really hard for me to teach this today. Cause I can't disciple a demon and, and, and you can't cast out dumb. You know what I mean? So, so y'all need to, come on somebody. A couple weeks ago with that whole Olympic thing, it was just, they mocked the Lord's, the Lord's Supper. Why is it? I was thinking, why is it that our, our culture doesn't mock Muhammad or Buddha or Confucius or any of those, like the, the tons of other Buddhist gods or something. You know why? Because there's only one threat to the powers and principalities of this world, and his name is Jesus. Jesus. <laughs> See, when the Bible talks about spiritual battles and war, I, we need to understand this is not a metaphor. It's not like, hey, the Christian life is like a war. No, you are in war. You're in a literal battle. You have a real enemy that wants to kill, destroy, and rob you. The Bible says that the unseen world impacts and affects the seen world that you and I live in. And for anyone here that's like, ah, I really don't believe that. Yes, you do. You believe that? That's why when you come out of Walmart, you put on hand sanitizer. Sometimes two pump in that thing, pop, pop. You know, like, ah. Why? Because you believe that there's some unseen things there that can get you sick. Come on, somebody. In this series, here's what I want to do. I want to expose the enemy's schemes, the, the, the battle plans and strategy of the enemy, the three battlegrounds, the demonic principalities, we're gonna learn about those. The worldly system and how it's set up under the control and dominion of the enemy and the battle of our flesh. Today though, I wanna help you see that there are spiritual forces at work all around us. And I hope today to make you a little bit more aware and attuned to the spiritual realities today. Because when you read the Old Testament, even maybe even other historical literature and stuff, the gods were everywhere. They haunted the ancient world, these, these gods, whether it was Ra in Egypt, Dionysus in, in Greece, Obatala in Africa, Tiamat in Babylon, Shiva in India, and like countless other gods. There's so many. To the modern mind, the phenomena of the gods is a product of man's imagination, like a projection of his fears and his fantasies and his desires. And to a certain part of the, that, that's, that's correct. But what if there's more to it? What if there is another dynamic in the mix? What if there is a, another realm? What if I told you that the ancient gods, the ones we read about in history and in the scriptures are not just stories? What if I told you that these idols, these demons, and these false gods are real spiritual entities that seek to control and dominate mankind even today? Well, let me show that to you in scripture then, okay? Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 17 says of the Israelites that they sacrificed to who? To demons, not to God, to gods whom they have not known, new gods who came lately, like you didn't know about these gods. These are new gods to you. You just came to the land of Canaan. You just discovered these gods. Your fathers and ancestors didn't know these gods. They didn't fear these gods. And already you're, this is what he's saying. That wasn't just a fantasy. It wasn't just a projection. It wasn't your imagination. You sacrificed the demons, he says, demons. That word demon, when you see it in your Old Testament, the Old Testament was written in Hebrew. Original language is Hebrew. But that word demon in Hebrew is shadim, shadim. And, and the word shadim literally means evil spirits is what that means. When the Bible was translated into Greek, that word turns into daimonia, which is where we get the word demon, okay? Not, not imagination, but a spiritual entity. 
Let me show it to you in Psalm 106. It says, they worship their idols, which led to their downfall. They even sacrificed their sons and their daughters to demons, not to imaginations, to demons. In the New Testament, when the apostle Paul was speaking to the church at Corinth, which, which had a bunch of new believers that were coming out of a pagan, idolatry, demon-worshiping religion and ideology, he encouraged them like this in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 20. The things which the Gentiles sacrificed to, look, they sacrificed to who? To demons, not to God. And he says, and I, don't, I want you to understand this because I don't want you to have any partaking or fellowship with these demons that they are worshiping in their sacrifice. This isn't an imagination. This isn't a projection. This pagan worship, there were spirits behind it. So the question though is, what happened to these spirits that we see all throughout the Old Testament and all throughout the world for generations and generations? Why don't we see them like we did? Here's what happened. Jesus happened. That's what happened. The gospel happened. The kingdom of God happened. The cross happened. That's what happened. Colossians 2, 15 tells us, when Jesus had disarmed the rulers and authorities, those supernatural forces of evil operating against us, he made a public example of them, exhibiting them as captives in his triumphal procession, having triumphed over them through the cross. God prevailed. Can I get an amen, somebody? The gospel prevailed in the Roman Empire and throughout the Western civilization. The temples of Zeus were abandoned. The shrines of Dionysus were forsaken. The message of the gospel and God's love and forgiveness overcame the reign of the gods. And polytheism and pantheism of the Greco-Roman world gave way to the belief in one God. And the spell of the gods was broken. But if behind the gods were the spirits, what happened to the spirits? Here's what you need to understand. Spirits don't die. They just wait for a comeback tour. The title of today's message is The Return of the Gods. The Return of the gods. See, they've been away for a long time. They've been away for ages. In their glory days, these gods reigned over tribes and nations, kingdoms and empires. They subjugated cultures and mastered civilizations, infusing them with their spirit, saturating them with their images, possessing them. Kings bowed down to them. Priests sang songs and performed rituals in their name. Armies marched out and sieged cities in their name. Children, rich and poor, free and slave alike, exalted them, worshiped them, entreated their favor, invoked their power, danced to the drumbeat of their festivals. They dreamed of them. They loved them, served them, and feared them. But how did these ancient gods return? If they, in fact, have returned. Jesus actually gives us the answer in a parable that he told us. In Matthew chapter 12 about demonic spirits. Look at this with me, Matthew chapter 12. When an impure spirit, Jesus says, comes out of a person, it goes through arid places seeking rest and does not find it. Then it says, the spirit says, I will return to the house I left. Jesus is speaking about a man possessed here by an unclean spirit and the spirit is wandering, but it will always desire to come back to the house or the person from which he was cast out of. Okay, he continues, when it arrives, it finds the house unoccupied, swept clean, and put in order. Then it goes and takes with it seven other spirits more wicked than itself, and they go in and live there. And the final condition of that person is worse than the first. And at first glance, it seems like this is a parable. Jesus is talking about a possessed man who was delivered and got repossessed, and it certainly can be applied to that situation, but this passage isn't actually about a man at all. This is an analogy Jesus is using, an illustration to teach a very important spiritual principle. The key comes in the very last verse that Jesus gives us, because right after he says, the last state of the man is worse than the first, Jesus adds this, that is how it will be with this wicked, what? Generation. See, this parable's immediate application appears to be the generation that Jesus entered into, first century Judea. The generation Jesus entered was comprised of a house of spirits, a civilization possessed by gods and spirits. But into that house, into that generation, came the word of God, the spirit of God, and the gospel. And that generation was set free from the spirits and became, as the parable said, a house set 
in order. Civilization cleanse. But what happened to the principalities? Jesus tells us they didn't die, they didn't go away. They existed outside of civilization, outside of the house, in desolate places is where they dwelled in the shadows. So how do these spirits return? Only one way. If that generation should ever turn away from God, from his word, from Jesus, from the gospel, that which drove out the spirits would not be present to protect it from its return. This isn't just about individuals. This is about entire cultures. According to Jesus, it's not just individuals that can be possessed. Entire civilizations can be possessed. Entire cultures and generations. When the gospel drove out the spirits of the pagan world, it was like a cultural exorcism. It was, the, it was the greatest mass exorcism we'd ever seen of our culture. But now, I will submit to you, and I'm going to show you, hopefully, to increase your awareness, that the gods of ancient times dwell among us again. They inhabit our institutions. They walk in the halls of our governments. They cast votes in our legislatures. They guide our corporations. They gaze out from our skyscrapers. They perform on our stages. They are teaching in our universities. They saturate our media. They direct our news cycles. They, they infuse and inspire our entertainment. They give voices to our songs. They, they perform on stages and theaters and stadiums. They light up televisions and computer screens. They incite new movements and ideologies to convert their followers. They instruct our children and initiate them into their ways. They demand our worship, our veneration, our submission, and our sacrifices. The gods have returned, and they are everywhere. They have permeated our culture. They've mastered our civil civilization. These gods of ancient times are here, but these spirits returning aren't coming back randomly. They have a strategy. Uh, at the heart of their strategy is what some authors call the dark trinity. If you look in the Old Testament, there are three main false gods, demonic entities that are recurring entities, three main ones. And all throughout civilization, these gods are repeated, maybe called different names, but they are the same manifestation of the same evil spirit and demonic being across civilization. There are three main ones that stand out across civilization, but especially in the scriptures. They're called the Dark Trinity. Now, I'm going to, convince, I'm going to try to show you today how these spirits have returned to our culture. Y'all with me today? Okay, here, here's here, the first member of the dark trinity um, is the most prominent in the Old Testament. He usually is the first to steal the hearts of the people. And you probably sound familiar. Number one is Baal. Baal, if you've read the Old Testament, you're probably uh, familiar with that, that, that name, Baal. He's the God of materialism and secularism. He was worshiped as the provider and was the one who brought prosperity and success. In ancient times, people believed that Baal would guarantee prosperity or material success. Today, we don't bow down to statues, but the spirit of Baal is alive and well as our culture relentlessly pursues wealth and prosperity. Let me show it to you in the Old Testament, Judges chapter two. It says, then the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord and served the Baals. They forsook the Lord, the God of their ancestors, who had brought them out of Egypt, they followed and worshiped various gods of the peoples around them. Jeremiah 23 and 27 says, their ancestors forgot the name of God, forgot the name of Yahweh because of Baal. So slowly the Israelites would welcome this, this spirit of Baal through their pursuit of materialism, success, prosperity, or even their acceptance of secularism around them. But the story doesn't end with Ancient Israel, remember, spirits don't die. They just are waiting to return to the house. We can see the same pattern in our young nation. The spirit of Baal returning. How so? In the 1960s, America began to systematically remove prayer from its schools. Many of us were not alive at that time. Maybe your parents told you stories about that. But in the Old Testament, the Ten Commandments were like a safeguard to the Israelites against false gods of the culture around them. And the reason was the very first commandment is there shall be no other gods before me. So Baal, for Baal to gain possession of Israel, he had to separate the people from the law and the commands of God. And this is exactly what he does. Second Kings chapter 17, verse 16 tells us that they abandon all the commandments of the Lord, their God. 
So in the 1980s, the Supreme Court ruled that it was no longer legal to display the Ten Commandments in public schools. How many of you remember that? They took the Ten Commandments out of public schools. This was, in, in a lot of ways, this was like a reverse exorcism. We started exercising God from our public life. See, in monotheism, there is one God and one truth. But in a polytheism, there is multiple gods and multiple truths. Today, people can claim their own truth no matter how absurd it is. I'm not a man. I'm a dog. I'm a tree. This isn't just wokeism. This is paganism reborn, church. And check this out. The most prominent symbol of Baal in ancient times and throughout other civilizations as well, but especially the Old Testament, the most prominent symbol of Baal is a bull. Could it be that the, this, this God of materialism and prosperity has returned to America in the same form? Because if you go down to Wall Street, the center of prosperity and wealth, you see right there the Wall Street bull, the charging bull in plain sight. And I think it's up there. If you got it, you got to go with me. There you go. The photo of the bull. There you go. Now, here, let, me, let me give you the description of this this bull. Its aggressive posture with lowered head and flaring nostrils embodies the bullish spirit of financial prosperity is what it says. In essence, here's what it says. The charging bull is more than just a sculpture. It's more than just a sculpture. It's a powerful symbol that encapsulates the spirit of New York City and the relentless drive for success in the financial markets. Now, the, the artists that made this and the people that allowed this, they didn't know what they were doing, but Baal did. But the spirit behind it did. Much of America worships at the altar of prosperity. Now, while the arenas of education, Wall Street, even politics are affected by supernatural battles, they're not the answer. They're not the main battlefield that we need to be fighting on. You all need to understand politics is not the ultimate answer. And we need to understand, especially in an election year like it is, it's a way to fight. We need to be fighting that battle in politics or education. I get it, but it's not the ultimate answer. And I just want to implore you, church, to be very careful this year and in the coming months. If you are more concerned about who's going to spend the next four years in the White House than you are who's going to spend an eternity in heaven, then it's most likely you serve the God of this world than the kingdom of God. If you haven't already read Screw Tape Letters by C.S. Lewis, I strongly encourage that. Uh, or even if you want to skip to chapter 23, if you're not familiar with Screw Tape Letters, it's this fictional book, a Christian fictional book about a senior demon training a junior demon on how to take control and captivate and ensnare Christians or their projects. And in chapter 23, he kind of tells him, he says, hey, if you can ever get your project, if you if you can ever get your Christian to see his faith as a means to a political end, then he'll begin to see Jesus as a lobbyist and not your Lord. And which in effect takes the relationship away because Jesus will never be your lobbyist. He will only be your Lord. All right, let's move on to the second one. Y'all with me today still? Okay. So we see, look, this is the first, the first spirit behind Baal that we see returning, wealth and prosperity, returning and captivating our culture, stealing hearts. The second member of the dark trinity, write it down, is Ashtoreth. Ashtoreth. She is the goddess of sexual immorality and pornography. If Baal's goal is to possess and control, Ashtoreth's mission is to seduce and corrupt. She was worshiped as the goddess of sex and, and love and war, but her influence was all about unbridled sexual immorality. Her goal, Asterisk's goal, was to take what God designed as sacred and twist it into something profane. First Samuel 12, 10 says, they cried out to the Lord and said, we've sinned, we've forsaken the Lord and served the Baals and the Asterisk. Notice how Baal comes first and, and then Asterisk follows. All throughout the Old Testament, you see first Baal, then comes Asterisk. It's like a one-two punch. First, lead people away from God and then ensnare them in a web of immorality. Think about the timeline here. In the 1960s, America began to push God out of the public square and right on the heels of that movement comes the sexual revolution. That's not a coincidence. As soon as the spirit of Baal took root, Ashtoreth followed with a wave of sexual immorality that swept through our culture. This, this revolution was not just a social movement. It was a spiritual invasion, church. Ashtoreth is not just about promiscuity. She's about taking sex 
out of the sacred confines of Merid and flooding the marketplace with it. The Greek word for prostitute is porne, which is where we get the word pornography. Pornography literally translates the literature of the prostitute. Some of the oldest literature we have of pornography is from Asterisk's writing in her temples, in her tablets. It's from her, herself. In ancient times, she was known as the sacred prostitute. And her temple was places of ritualistic immorality. Now, she doesn't have those temples anymore, but her temples are online. Her temples are in movies and advertisements and everywhere. We've seen sex taken out of the sacred and thrust into every corner of culture, sexualizing everything. And not only that, Astrith also is the goddess of the occult. She brings in occult practices. Look at the occult practices following the sexual revolution. That's not a coincidence. The Bible warns us of this dark connection between sexual immorality and occult practices. There are now more witches in the United States of America than there are Presbyterians. This isn't just about changing mor morals. It's spiritual warfare, church. But there's even a, a darker side to Ashtoreth. There's another side. Crucial to understand, especially in the world that we're living in right now. Her ancient tablets, on her ancient tablets, it read this. It reads this. I am a woman. I am a man. Her songs that she would, she would sing and her priests would sing in her temples would declare she had the power to turn men into women and women into men. She was the original destroyer of gender, of male and female. And what we're seeing now in our culture, the confusion and the blurred lines of gender lines, it's not natural. It's spiritual. And this spirit couldn't have taken root in the 1960s. It would have been rejected outright. But as Ashtoreth entrenched herself into the culture, her darker manifestations are emerging now in our generation. Her sacred texts say, you grind away the masculinity of man. And we see that today, a war on manhood and masculinity today, taking men out of fatherhood, out of the role of providers and protectors. She seeks to feminize men and defeminize women. Her ancient priesthood included men, check this out, who dressed in drag, talk like women, dress like women, acted like women, and even surgically transitioned to appear as women. Remember, Jesus said that these spirits would come back, but they would come back worse off than when it was then. See, because originally she would just possess her priest, but now she wants to possess your children. Now she's after this generation. And I'll go even further. There was one month that Ashtoreth was worshipped, and she would cast spells on the culture and society. They would do colorful parades, sexualized parades, wherever she was worshipped. One month. Guess what month that was? June, tell me the gods have not returned and are not influencing culture. I know the people that are in the parades and doing all that stuff, they're not like, they don't think they're doing it for Ashtoreth. They're not thinking there's a spirit behind it, but I promise you, child of God, that is a demonic attack. That is demonic. This is not natural. It's spiritual. Ashtoreth had laid the groundwork and her seduction paved the way for this final member of the dark trinity. Write it down. You might be familiar with this name in the Old Testament. His name is Molech, the third god of the dark trinity. Molech, the god of death and violence. His influence is the darkest of all. If Baal's mission is possession and Asterisk is seduction, Molech is after just outright destruction. He wants to destroy you. 1 Kings chapter 11, verse 7. Then Solomon built a high place for Chemosh, the abomination of Moab. And look what he says. For Molech, he calls him the abomination of the Ammonites on the mountain east of Jordan. Why was he called the abomination? Because Molech's worship involved child sacrifice. Parents would sacrifice their children to the flames of Molech for the promise of prosperity and gain favor from their God. And it may seem like that barbaric pra practice is like a relic of the past, but that spirit of Molech is alive today. In the 1970s, the United States legalized abortion. And it became the law of the land. I understand it's been switched now. Some states are going back on it. But since then, millions of unborn children have been sacrificed on the altar of convenience and prosperity. Wherever a culture has sexual immorality, you will always have child sacrifice. All throughout history. And people justify abortion for a lot of reasons. Career advancement, financial stability. It's the same reasons ancient pagans offered their children to Molech. Let me just pause and just say... 
because I see a lot of clinching happening right now. Um, we live in a very hyper-politicized hyper culture where everything is politicized, but I need you to know this is not a political topic. This is a moral issue. This is a moral issue. If you haven't figured this out yet, the strategy in our day of some politicians and even media pundits are to take moral issues and then reframe them as political issues um, so that they can accuse any Christian of getting too political when you engage them in this. But the church is not getting more political. Politicians got more theological. Okay, see, when, when the government moved past things like teaching math and building roads and issuing driver's license to things like redefining marriage, erasing gender, reframing late-term abortion as, as reproductive rights, and then indoctrinating everybody's kids and believing those things, the church didn't move, you did. Politics did. They moved on my turf here. This has always been a moral issue, always. It's just reframed to try to win the battle. See, when Israel turned away from God, they started offering children as sacrifices. Moloch's influence led to a widespread death and violence. Human and child sacrifice was common in the pagan world. It was not safe to be a child in the pagan world, just like it is today, still in some pagan parts of the world. It is not safe. The only thing that delivered this practice was the gospel of Jesus Christ across the world. This is not a social issue. This is a spiritual battle. Moloch spirit drives people to justify the unjustifiable, to, the, to accept the unacceptable. What we are witnessing today in our generation, in our culture, is a mass repossession of culture. The spirits have come back and found the house empty. And the latter case is worse than the first. This isn't just a societal trend. This is a spiritual takeover. And you hear words like tolerance today. Please understand, tolerance is not the goal. Will you write this down somewhere? The Shadim agenda, like the, the, the daimonia, the demonic agenda is not tolerance. It's dominion. That's what they desire, dominion. John 10.10 10 says, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. You don't tolerate that. You don't tolerate steal, kill, and destruction. Jesus says, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Amen, somebody? So I've exposed the dark trinity. We see Baal, Ashtoreth, and Molech, that these ancient spirits, they didn't die. They don't die. They just come back in different forms, oftentimes worse than when they were first introduced. But what you need to understand, church, is we are not powerless. Like we, the same gospel that drove them out centuries ago can drive them out again. It's time for us to take action, to stand up, stand firm, reclaim the ground that was lost, and enter the spiritual warfare arena. Amen? That's what we need. So throughout this, this series, I'm going to bring you the battle and show you how to, get, how to get breakthrough. But today, let me kind of explain to you the mission that is at hand. As we begin this journey of 30 days of freedom, the mission that is at hand right now is the same mission that Jesus gave the disciples when he commissioned them to go drive out the spirits of their world and expand the kingdom of their world. Let me, let me give you four thoughts here as we begin this journey. Number one, we got to take the battle to the spirit realm. We're gonna take the battle to the spirit realm. Understand there's a battle in the ballot box and there's a battle for education. There's, there's all these other battles, but you need to understand those are inferior battles. And what we are gonna do for 30 days is take these battles to the spirit realm. And here's what I need you to know about this. You have already won. You are already victorious. The devil is defeated. You are already won. We have to understand this. You fight for, from victory, not for victory. Okay, you, you have to understand greater is he that is in you than he that's in the world. We can take the battle to the spiritual realm because we are armed, equipped, and victorious already. It's like, I, I like watching NFL. My team is the Eagles, uh, the Philadelphia Eagles. Amen, praise the Lord, it's gonna be a great year. I, you know, I used to watch them habitually like it was, a, it was an idol for me. It ain't no more, but I still record the games and I teach all Sunday, you know, and I'm gonna go watch it. But, Veronica will oftentimes check the score before I do. She'll check the score, check the highlights. So we get home, we're gonna watch it together. And there's like a turnover or an interception. And I'm like, dang it. No, I'm kidding. I don't do that anymore, you guys. But I'm like, dang, come on, come on. And, and she said, Veronica's like, fear not, fear not, honey. Fear not, I know the end of the story. Yo, Listen, you all need to read the rest of the story. Revelations, it says, you win, the devil loses. Amen? 
So we can take our spiritual, we can take our battle to the spiritual realm knowing we have already won. Ephesians chapter six says it like this. Put on all the armor that God supplies. And I recently taught about the armor of God. You can check it out in the archives of our sermons. But he says, put on that whole, all the armor. In this way, you can take a stand against the devil's strategies. We're gonna talk about that and I'll teach you his strategies. This is not a wrestling match against a human opponent. Stop fighting human opponents. Stop fighting the things of this world. We are wrestling with rulers, authorities, the powers who govern this world of darkness, the spiritual forces that control evil in the heavenly world. I'll, we'll touch on that next week. I'm gonna to talk to you about the demonic principalities, what you need to know how to defeat demonic principalities. He goes on and talks about the armor of God, but then he says in verse 18, and pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests with this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Isn't it interesting that after all the armor of God, the helmet, the breastplate, the, the, the belt, the shoes, the shield, the sword, like after everything, how do we use the armor? And he goes, and this is how you use it, pray and pray. Put on all that armor and don't go like, no, 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 pray in the spirit. That's how you do it. So here's what we're gonna do for 30 days. Today, we're starting a, a new season of prayer that we are going to separate ourselves, consecrate ourselves, that we are gonna take the battle to the spirit realm and begin praying. I'll help you out with that. We got resources online and how to and what that looks like, but this is what I'd like to do together as we begin this journey of 30 days of freedom that we're gonna to begin to take the battle in the spirit realm and pray suited up in our, in our armor. Prayer is the front line defense in spiritual battles. Think of it like our spiritual Wi-Fi connection to God. It's invisible, but it's essential for everything we do. Just like Wi-Fi connects you to the network of information and resources, prayer connects us to the limitless power and wisdom of God. We have to pray. See, when, when, when they took prayer out of school, that wasn't the big problem. The problem was prayer left our homes first. See, the only reason why the demonic strategy, that demonic strategy was successful on the platform of education was because he was already successful on the platform of parenting. And I don't, I'm not seeking to restore prayer to the White House. I'm seeking to restore a prayer to your house. <laughs> so here's, here's the first thing that we're gonna do today. We're gonna start taking these battles to the spirit realm, church starting today for the next 30 days. And number two, we are going to dethrone every idol in our life. Every idol in our life, every idol that was erected in our life, every Moloch, every area where we're pursuing materialism, secularism, every area where there is sexual immorality or pornography, every idol in our life is gonna be dethroned in Jesus' name. We're gonna identify them one at a time, identify and disarm and destroy every idol. It's interesting, every time that the Israelites would turn away from God, they would erect these different idols and altars to these gods, but every time God would restore them, he would command them to tear them down. Just like in, in, in Judges chapter six, when God comes to Gideon, he calls a mighty warrior. I know you look like, you feel like, you're the weakest in your family, but I see you as a mighty warrior, Gideon. And he tells him this, he says, the same night the Lord said to him, Take the second bull from your father's herd, the one seven years old, tear down your father's altar to Baal and cut down the Asherah pole beside it. That's a prophetic word for some of you today that need to demolish some of the stuff that was handed down to you by your ancestors. That need to de destroy and take down some of the things that your parents, some of the habits your parents gave you. Some of the things you picked up from your household that they gave you. You need to tear some of those things down. What, what are the, the bales and the ashras in our lives today? It could be your career, a pursuit of wealth or money, a desire for recognition, status. It can be that relationship. It can be that pornography addiction in that section. You need to understand, child of God, that when you are clicking on that site, you're not just pleasuring yourself with Pornhub. You are worshiping a demon. You are opening a door for an ancient spirit that has been around much longer than you that wants to steal, kill, and destroy you and your entire house. It's not a game. This is not a game. This is war. This is real. This is a battle. We're gonna take the battle 
to the spirit realm. But then we need to identify the idols in our life and destroy them. But God's instruction to Gideon didn't stop at just tearing down the idol. Look at that last sentence. If you put it up on there again, it says, he says, then build the proper kind of altar to the Lord your God. He was also commanded to build that. See, this is a powerful principle for us. It's not enough to just remove the idols from our lives. You got to replace the idols. You can't just tear down idols. You got to build up altars to God. If we remove idols from our lives, it creates a void that needs to be filled because the spirits will come back and see your house empty and in order, but bring back seven others if you don't fill it with the right altars. So we're gonna take the battle to the spirit realm for 30 days. And I would be honored to lead you to identify some things. We're gonna tear down some idols and some altars. But number three, church, we're gonna spread the gospel like never before. We're gonna spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. Listen, there is sharing the good news of Jesus Christ is how we extend God's kingdom and bring his light into the darkness. This is the power, the kingdom of God that expels every demonic spirit, every shadim, demonia, every spirit from our culture. It is the gospel. It's not your good works. It's not your kindness. It's not your efforts. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ that commands the darkness to flee. Just as I was saying where Jesus told his disciples and commissioned them to go out, I believe in our generation, there is another commissioning happening. Because just like the disciples were taking the gospel and the kingdom of God into a pagan world and introducing people to the love and power of Jesus Christ and delivering people of spirits, I believe there is a new commissioning that is happening in the kingdom of God, that we are taking this gospel anew and afresh into a pagan world possessed by these spirits. Let me show you Matthew chapter 28. Jesus came to them and said, Here's his commission. I believe it's another commission happening today. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, here's what we need to do, church. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And we're gonna teach them to obey everything that Jesus commanded them. And surely Jesus says, I am with you always to the very end, the age. In Philippians chapter two, it says, at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. When we proclaim the name of Jesus, we're calling people to a decision. Will they bow the knee to Jesus or will they continue to go their own way? This isn't just about gaining followers and filling seats in our church. This is about calling people to repentance about calling people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus. And maybe you don't know all the scriptures, but you can tell your story, church. And the powerful thing about that is people can argue with theology, but they can't argue what Jesus did in your life. So we're gonna, we're gonna take the battle to the spirit realm. We're gonna identify and dethrone idols. We're gonna share the gospel of Jesus Christ. And number four, we need to learn how to speak the truth in love. Okay, you can't just speak the truth. You gotta be able to speak the truth in love. No longer can we stay silent anymore, but we also can't be abrasive and rude and defame the love of Jesus. Misrepresent the heart of Jesus. In a world filled with confusion and deception, it is so vital that we stand firm in our faith and communicate God's truth with both compassion and conviction. Truth confronts, but love connects. Romans 1.16 says, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. Truth without love is harsh, but love without truth is hollow. The prophet Elijah was, was a prophet during a time where Israel walked away again, started worshiping the Baals and Asherahs. And he, he kind of gave them in one, and I'm going to show it to you, the prophet Elijah gave them a challenge, the people of Israel challenge, that I wanna to give to you today as we begin this 30 days of freedom together, I wanna to give you the same challenge. I wanna give you the challenge of the prophet, Elijah. First Kings chapter 18, 21. Elijah went before the people and he said, how long will you waver between two opinions? How long will you play this game with God? How long will you come to church and embrace some Christian values, but still live like you don't know him in other areas of your life. How long are you gonna play this game? 
Israel? If the Lord is God, then follow him already. I like to say it like this. If the Lord is God, then go all in. Stop wavering between two. Go all in. If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, let me say this. If wealth is your God, if success is your God, if money is your God, if women or men or sexual immorality, if, if that's your God, then go follow him. Go follow her. See what that God has for you. You go take care of that. And this, as I read this, my, I just sunk in my spirit. It cannot be our answer today what they answered. Look what they said. But the people said, what? No longer can we just sit back and be idle, be bystanders, be spectators to the kingdom of God. No longer can we sit in a culture possessed by demonic spirits and act like you, your family, are not going to be stolen from, destroyed, or killed. No longer. If the Lord is God, then give him your life. Then go all in. And this is how I want to begin this 30 days of freedom with you. As we present, every week I'll present you with a battle and how to get breakthrough. But it begins right here. How long will we waver between the two opinions? Let's follow God. Can I pray that over you? Come on. Hey, thank you for watching the Discovery Church YouTube channel. Don't stop here. Join the Discovery Online family every Sunday. Subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a single video or live stream event and share it with a friend. You can also support the ministry by clicking the Give button to help us continue to reach people around the world for Jesus Christ. Thank you again for watching. Go love God, love each other, and change the world.